Washington, D.C. Speaks to America event with Professor Muhammad Yunus. We are very pleased to host this event with Grameen America in cooperation with the United Nations Foundation for the National Capital Area, the Community Foundation, and Promontory Financial. We are delighted that so many of you brave the weather. I was teaching economics in one of the universities of Bangladesh. I'm teaching in my classrooms about the five-year plan. My apologies. We are delighted that so many of you were able to brave the weather this evening, and we are happy to see a number of students and interns here as well. The program this evening will begin momentarily with a short video highlighting Grameen America's new initiatives in the United States. Following the short video, Professor Yunus will give remarks on these new initiatives, and we'll, we will then open the floor for questions. Two standing mics will be available for questions. Please remember to keep your questions short and limited to just one question. As a courtesy, I ask that you all turn off your cell phones or electronic devices. Um, please turn off your Blackberries as well. They'll interrupt with the video feed and the audio feed this evening. And thank you, and please enjoy. Millions of dollars or billions of dollars have to be invested to change the lives of the people here next door. People need it less than a dollar apiece and there's nobody who can help them. So I went to the local bank to arrange loans for them, and the bank manager said they cannot lend money to the poor people because they are not credit worthy. I said, I'll become a guarantor, I'll take the money to the people and see whether this is true. My work is started giving loans to 42 people total amount of $27. Today we go into a big bank. Right now we give loans to 7.5 million borrowers in Bangladesh. No collateral, no guarantee, no legal purpose. 97% of them are women. And one after another loan, they change their life. They move out of poverty consistently. We can create a world absolutely free from poverty. After the Nobel Peace Prize, suddenly everybody is willing to listen. Suddenly all the doors are open, the doors that you have been banging for many, many years. It's great to serve us. in this program. 100% repayment record. And at the poorest people, people who are not able to go to those banks, paying back every penny, paying back every week, 100%. Congratulations to you. You have been at the forefront of a big, big history that you are going to make. It's almost like uh, landing in the moon. Your small step will be a giant step for all of America. Because if your program, you make it successful,
this will open the door for many, many millions of people in this country who do not have this service from the other kind of banks. Where you will be opening this door for the rest of America. Good evening, and welcome to this very special program. My name is Heidi Shoup. As president of the World Affairs Council of Washington, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, there are seats up in front here if uh, people want to move up in front. Our council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational organization that seeks to increase the public's understanding of the major issues of international affairs and U.S. foreign policy actions that impact the United States and our relations with the rest of the world. The Council sponsors public programs such as this one and, is, and a growing number of programs with and within schools to help provide a global education to the next generation of Americans. For those of you who are joining us for the first time this evening, we hope that it will be the first of many events that you will find interesting and worthwhile. Tonight, we are honored to host Professor Muhammad Yunus, founder of Grameen Bank, and we thank him for joining us today and the World Affairs audience who will watch us via video. We hear a lot these days about banks not lending to people, increasingly, it seems, even to people with good credit. Our speaker took a look at the issue of credit or lack thereof among the poorest of the poor in his native Bangladesh and concluded that poverty was not created by poor people, but rather was created by an economic and social system that denied credit to the very poor. The poor didn't lack initiative or talent. They lacked the access to credit. His concept reversed the conventional banking practice by removing the need for collateral and created a banking system based upon mutual trust, accountability, participation, and creativity. Professor Yunus was born and raised in Bangladesh. He came to America in 1965 as a Fulbright scholar, and in in 1970, was awarded a PhD in economics from Vanderbilt University. In 1976, as head of the Rural Economics Program at the University of Chittagong, where he was professor of economics, he launched a project to, to examine the possibility of designing a credit delivery system to the rural poor. The rest, as they say, is history. In the ensuing three decades, millions of borrowers have been raised up out of poverty and his model has inspired similar efforts all over the world. This remarkable accomplishment was recognized with the award of the Nobel Peace Prize in October of 2006. The Nobel Committee cited the Grameen Bank and Muhammad Yunus for their efforts to create economic and social development from below. In the words of the Nobel Committee, lasting peace cannot be achieved unless large population groups find ways in which to break out of poverty. Microcredit is one such means. 
development from below also serves to advance democracy and human rights, end quote. As of December 2008, Grameen Bank serves 99% of the villages in Bangladesh and has lent over 7 billion U.S. dollars to 7.6 million people, 97% of them women. 64% of the borrowers who have been with the bank for five years or more have crossed the poverty line. Grameen Bank today operates in 38 countries worldwide and continues to be owned by the rural poor for whom it was founded and whom it serves. In January 2008, Grameen America began operations to bring this business model that combines the power of free markets with a socially driven mission to the United States. A social business, as Professor Yunus explains in his new book, A World Without Poverty, is cause-driven rather than profit-driven. While its investors recoup their investments and more, the business concentrates on creating products or services that provide a social good. Professor Yunus is with us today, tonight, to talk about Grameen America and also to, pre to preview Grameen Health, a program that aims to extend the success of microfinance to health care and to establish a sustainable best practices in a broad range of health care services for a broad market, including the poor. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege to introduce Professor Muhammad Yunus, who will have a few remarks after which he will take questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, I'm delighted that uh, I could uh, be here with you and uh, kind of brief you on what goes on in Grameen Bank and uh, what are our uh, efforts and initiative directed to right now. Uh, in this um, moments of financial crisis, I, I've been asked many times that uh, how this financial crisis uh, impacts on Grameen Bank. Because since all banks are going down, having difficulties, since Grameen Bank is a bank, probably it will have similar fate. And I'm reassuring everybody that uh, we are okay, we have no problem. And uh, <clears throat> they are disappointed. <laughs> because uh, these days people want, don't expect to hear such a bank has no problem. <laughs> uh, literally we don't have any problem because first of all, we are not connected with the international financial centers in any way. We don't borrow money, we don't lend money, we have no connection whatsoever. Uh, we don't borrow from anybody, not from Bangladeshi government or Bangladeshi bank, forget about the international marketplace. So that gives us a strength. Grameen Bank has 2,600 branches, and each branch is required to mobilize its own fund by taking deposits. So it's not Grameen Bank has a stack of money and then give the money to, to the branch, branch lends the money to the poor people. It's not like that. Branch mobilized the money and lends the money to the local poor women. So it's a very localized system. And when we start a new branch, or the, for the, when we select the staff to go out and create this new branch, we give the address where we want to open the branch to the manager of that branch who is going to open it. And he will have to take this address with his colleagues to go there to set up a bank. We don't give him any money. And we tell him that you find the money, you lend the money to the poor people, and within one year, you should come to the even point. We cannot pay your salary from here. You have to find the salary there with your money. So that salary has to come from your income, not from the deposit of the people that you are getting collecting. So within 12 months, they have to become uh, self-sustaining. Most of the new branches can do that. Only in, say, 15, 20% of the cases, 
take more than 12 months, maybe 13 months, maybe 14 months, but that's about it. So this is the whole system. This is very localized. It's a local money going to the local poor people. Not only that, we evaluate our branches by some kind of indicators which are expressed by uh, giving stars, like you have the star system in the uh, grading the hotels, three-star hotel, there are four-star hotel, five-star hotel, and five-star is the ultimate. You don't go beyond that, five-star hotel. So our branches are like that. Some are one-star branch, some are two-star, and some are five-stars. What are these stars for? If the branch has a perfect recovery record for the whole year, 100% recovery record, not for just one or two, all the borrowers that that branch serves. Then it gets a star for 100%. If it is 99.9% .9 recovery, then you don't get the star. So it has to be 100% throughout the year. Then you get the star. And if you have a star, then you can put it on your dress that you have the star, and st star has a color. So you say if it is a green color, that means you have a 100% recovery branch. If you have more deposits than the loan that you have given out, in other words, you have a plenty of reserves in your bank, in your branch. We need the reserve because we have, Bangladesh is a country with a lot of disasters. So you need ready money whenever a disaster hits so that you can take care of the people. Because after disaster, all our banking stops. We don't do the banking anymore. We become a humanitarian organization. Our job is to save people, save children, save families, give them food, give them shelter, give them medicine, everything. And no question asked, this is our responsibility. And when the disaster is over, then you know, our job is to rehabilitate them, give them fresh loans, so that they start their life all over again. For that, for that, you need extra cushion for yourself. So you have to have more money deposits than the money you lend out. If you have that, then you get another star, a brown star. If the branch makes profit, then you get another star, a blue star. So, and if all the children of all the families that you lend money to, suppose there are 5,000 borrowers in a branch, if all the 5,000 families have their children in the school, not a single child is missed, then the branch will get another star, a violet star. So again, the responsibility of the branch is to make sure the children of the borrowers must be in a school. So it's not what conventional banks would like to do. They don't know what your family does, but we, we worry a lot about the families that we work with because they are the owners of this bank. So our job is to make sure our owners really change their life for a better life. And the fifth, fifth star comes when all the 5,000 families cross over the poverty line. Not a single family is under poverty anymore. If one family is down, still you don't get the star. So that's a very tough job to have all the families out of the poverty line. Uh, then you have the five stars. Imagine a branch with five stars. That is the most commendable thing anybody can achieve. You run your branch with your money, and you have enough cushion for fight disasters. You are prepared for disasters. And quality of your banking <coughs> is comparable to any bank anywhere in the world. 100% repayment, better than any, any bank anywhere in the world. And then we have ensured all the children going to school. These are all illiterate families. Historically, in uh, all previous generations of these families never been to school. So this is the first generation that they're taking to school in 100%. So that's another uh, social accomplishment for the Grameen Bank branch. 
And then, having all the people connected with the bank, crossing over poverty. This is where all the world is trying to do. You have done it. It didn't cost anybody anything because we have not gotten any uh, donations or uh, anybody's subsidy or anything. Simply you took their money, local money, and changed the lives of the 5,000 families. So that's the kind of uh, ambition that we have. So make all branches, five-star branches. Today there are about out of uh, 2,600 branches, probably 150 branches, which we have with five stars, all five stars. So you, when you go to visit a Grameen Bank branch, first question probably you'll be asking, how many stars you got? And what is your plan for the next star? Which one you are working for? Because they have a g kind of plan. We will get this blue star on such and such year, and by this time, and we'll prepare for the uh, violet star. And by the end of this year, we'll get these two stars. So they are working for it. They are not just that waiting to go by and see that uh, it happens someday, but we don't know when. They, they have to have the plan so that they can work for it. If uh, they don't have it, they will not know when to, uh, how to proceed with their work. So this is basically what uh, is the reflection of our uh, total uh, goal. Uh, so in that context, uh, we would say still the work goes on despite the uh, financial situation uh, in the world. And we started a program uh, called Grameen America in New York City last year to start the Grameen uh, program uh, right here in the United States. And we sent someone from Bangladesh to start and work uh, that out in, in New York City. And one good thing about him that he never been to the United States before. So he couldn't change anything. He didn't know anything about America. He just does everything that he does in Bangladesh. He'd been working with us for 27 years. So he just followed what he, he has been doing. And luckily it works beautifully. And. Uh, now they have, you have seen the video, it's uh, nearly 500 borrowers now. Uh, some of the borrowers uh, you caught on the video. And the enthusiasm of the borrowers with the $2,200 average loans. Um, so it, it shows that it's not only in Bangladesh, people don't have the financial services available to them. They're also, as a rich, richest country in the world, you have the same type of uh, gap that financial institutions left behind so that you can come back and cover that up. So this is uh, uh, the Grameen America. Hopefully they can expand. And, uh, but one difference between Grameen America and uh, Grameen Bank in Bangladesh is not in the actual work, is on the legal status. In Bangladesh we are a bank, so we can take deposits. We don't have to go anybody to find money. But here it is not a bank, because getting a bank license is so complicated and so expensive. I was told it cost all, all together something like $30 million. We can't afford $30 million to get a license. So this has been uh, working as an NGO. So as an NGO, you cannot collect deposits. So somebody has to give the money to lend the money to these people. So money becomes a big issue here. Uh, how to expand it. We are trying to see if we can get a cheaper license like a, a credit union license. If you can do that, if you can afford to have a credit union license, then we will be able to uh, take deposits. Once we can collect deposits, it becomes so much easier because then you can find your money right where you work rather than uh, try to find money uh, uh, from somewhere else. So this is one big difference. I hope within one year we can, we'll be able to overcome it. We had a good meeting this morning with the Fed Chairman, uh, Mr. Barnecki, and um, briefed him what we are trying to do, and he uh, supported our effort. Uh, we met him some uh, one year back, more than one year, in October 2007, uh, briefing him that we are trying to start a program in New York City and how do we find a legal
for this, what kind of legal home we can get. And he was very sympathetic and enthusiastic. And today we told him that um, we have come this way and now we are moving into the next uh, step. Hopefully that will be easier. Uh, it's not complicated. It will not be time consuming. Usually I'm told that it takes more than a year to process the uh, licensing application. I hope that can be done a little earlier than that. So this is the uh, uh, um, uh, Grameen America situation. The Grameen idea has uh, spread in many, many countries. Today, uh, you can go to any country. There are microcredit programs uh, available uh, doing that. Within Grameen Bank, we lend money to uh, the 7.5 million borrowers. 97% of them are women. And they own the bank. This is another distinguishing feature of Grameen Bank. This is not only a bank which lends money to the poor people, it's also a bank which is owned by the poor people and owned by the poor women. Probably, uh, it's the only bank in the world which is owned by poor women. Uh, to find a bank owned by women of any kind is a kind of rare thing to happen uh, because banks are owned by men, that's a, and rich men. Uh, but it's not equally true that banks are owned by rich women. You don't see much. But this is a strange, this is owned by poor women. And they run, they are the one who sits in the board and run the bank. Uh, so this is another distinguishing feature. And we, as we say, we encourage the children to go to school. And some of them now are gradually coming to higher education. And waves of waves of students are coming to the higher education. We made sure that they continue with higher education, so we introduced education loans. Anybody who can qualify to go into higher education, money is guaranteed. You don't have to wait and apply and compete with others. You don't have to compete with anybody. Since you are a child of a Grameen family, it is your entitlement. If you go to higher education, you get all your expenses covered by Grameen education, Grameen education loans. Right now, we have more than 34,000 students in medical schools, engineering schools, universities, and all kinds of professional schools, all covered by Grameen education loans. And more and more as grow, the number becomes bigger and bigger. They continue to grow with that. So this is another aspect of it. And we got involved with many other issues, like technology issues. Uh, we created Grameen Phone, a mobile phone company, so that we can bring mobile phone into the villages of Bangladesh. And mobile phone has become a symbol for us of symbol of information technology penetrating into the poorest families. In the beginning, when we were trying to set it up as a company, uh, asking for a license from the bank, uh, from the government, government was extremely reluctant to give us a license because they said, you are a poor people's bank. You'll be helping poor people. Why do you need a mobile phone? Mobile phone is a, something to do with rich people. We said, no, we want to bring it to the poor people. That's our job. And if you, have a, if you give us a license, we'll first we'll, when we create the company, we'll bring the mobile phone in the villages. They were surprised. Why should anybody take mobile phone in the villages? Mobile phone should be in the cities so the business people and the rich people can handle it. We said, no, our purpose is completely different. We want to bring it to the villages. And then on top of it, we said, when we bring it to the villages, then we would like to give loans to the women of Grameen Bank to buy herself a telephone. And they were again big shock. Why should a poor woman have a cell phone? Because at that time, even the officials were talking, they don't have cell phones yet. <laughs> so they couldn't even figure out why a poor woman should have a cell phone. And then one of them asked, who is she going to call? <laughs> I said, no, no, she's not going to call anybody. That's not the purpose. She will earn money by selling the service of the phone because nobody has, has the phone yet. So she will have the monopoly power of this phone. And everybody has to come to her to make use of the phone and pay her, and she'll make money. And it was completely unthinkable at that time that uh, it can really happen that way. But that's the way we did it. And uh, she, they tell you, the, the women who got the telephone and started selling service. She became such a popular person in the village because everybody has to come to her to make a phone call. And she knew everything that is going on in that village. <laughs> you can't keep any secrets from her. <laughs> he 
is keeping people's secret, but you can't keep secret from her. One woman was telling me that, uh, I was telling that uh, how f you feel about uh, this business and so on, and how much money you're making. She said, forget about the money. It's such an important thing. You cannot have a wedding ceremony in the next five villages without being me invited into it. <laughs> She's such a person. She's a celebrity. That they, we call them telephone ladies. So you'll have in every single village of Bangladesh, you'll have telephone ladies. Now we have more than 300,000 telephone ladies all over Bangladesh. And telephone became absolutely so popular. Today, we have a, Bangladesh has a population of 150 million people. There are 45 million cell phone subscribers. Can you imagine how much it has penetrated in every single layer of society? So this has become something that we can penetrate into such a deep, uh, into the people's life. And then we want to make use of this in various ways. When these telephones are internet-enabled telephones. So not only telephone went, internet facility went there. So now we are thinking of building up a big healthcare program. Healthcare program in a way that will be depending uh, very much on the technology. Because it's very difficult to bring the doctors in the villages. You can't keep the doctors in the village. Because they want to go to the city where they can make more money. Who wants to come and work in the village? So as a result, there is no doctor in the village. Uh, what we are trying to do, uh, take this as a fact, not to fight with them, to bring them back to the village. So we're saying, okay, well, why don't we build a system where patients don't physically have to be present in, uh, in front of the doctor. This can be bridged by information technology. So the doctor gets all the information about the patient and decide what the treatment would be. And that decision can be communicated through the information technology to the patient and to the assistant that uh, is working with her so that she can now uh, interpret whatever is ac action has to be taken on that one and day to day uh, brief the doctor wh what is the outcome of this treatment. Uh, so that uh, that uh, doctor can be anywhere. That doctor could be in Dhaka, that doctor could be in Washington, D.C., doesn't matter uh, where the doctor is because all the information comes to you. So we need special types of uh, uh, diagnostic equipment so that directly we can transmit it. And transmission will be basically with the mobile phone. Mobile phone can transmit all your information, all your image, uh, digital images will be transferred to the uh, doctors back and forth. Uh, voices will come from the doctor to the patient. Doctor can talk to the patient, although physically she is far away, but uh, immediately you can talk to the patient and find out verbally what needs to be done or what needs to be done. So we are trying to build up a healthcare system the way we have done it uh, with the f microfinance that we brought financial services to the poorest people in an affordable way, in a sustainable way. Today, they don't say that oh, we can't pay, sorry, we can't take money because it's too expensive. Nobody says that. They're so happy that they got it and they can change their life with this money. Uh, and bank makes profit. When the bank makes profit, profit goes back to them because it's owned by them, they, they get it as a dividend. So it's a complete circle. So we want to build up the healthcare system in the similar way, so that uh, all, everybody gets the healthcare. healthcare. Uh, unlike Grameen Bank, which is uh, uh, dedicated to poor women, basically, uh, healthcare system will be uh, open to all, richest and the poorest, all of them will get the healthcare services. And it will be affordable to the poorest, uh, in a way it will be done, and it will be covered with health insurance and so on, built by health insurance, built by Grameen Bank. Uh, so this is our next stage that we want to uh, cover and we want to uh, address this issue because healthcare is a subject which is a big subject in the United States as you uh, remember, uh, as you see in your political discussions and the campaign issues. 
similarly, it's a, it's a health is an issue every country because <coughs> bulk of the population don't get uh, good health care, neither from the government service, if the government service exists in that country, nor from the private practice or the private companies because private companies uh, concentrate on the people who have money so that they can cover costs and make money from them. So this is how uh, the bulk of the people are left out from the decent, uh, dependable uh, healthcare system. So we want to address that issue as we, uh, uh, have this, uh, as we proceed to make sure that the healthcare system is also designed in a way that everybody can benefit from it and it can, be, uh, it can save people's lives. There are many diseases in the world uh, which can be cured very easily, but n nothing gets done. Uh, many deaths uh, which, are, which occurs unnecessarily, absolutely, no reason, like maternal death. There's no reason why anybody should die at childbirth, but they die, not in thousands or hundreds of thousands, they die in millions. It's, it's totally, unex uh, you one cannot justify why it should be done. So this is how, uh, this is uh, something that we want to address. Let's see how far we can go. And I'll stop here, and thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Yunus has about 20 minutes uh, that he can remain with us, and we'll take questions. We have microphones on either side of the room here, down toward the front. If you want to um, go to the microphones, please, so we can hear you. And um, please try to make your questions brief so we can get as many as possible. Hi. My name is Mubarak Akhtar. I'm attending a semester in Washington the program at Georgetown University. Um, I'm going to make my question brief. Um, I, was just, I was just curious on how you come about the recruitment process for the people who, who work for the, for the bank worldwide in all the, all the branches, whether in the States or in Bangladesh or, or anywhere else. And thank you. Well, just like uh, in Bangladesh, for example, we advertise in the newspaper, lots of young people apply, we go through the screening process and pick them up. Uh, our, uh, almost we uh, feel confident that um, anybody is good enough for us. Just because there are a lot of them applying, we have to go through the screening process. Otherwise, we can just pick it up and do that. Because it's actually, um, the work itself transforms you to the kind of thing that we do. Uh, everybody is just looking for a job. They are unemployed young people. Whatever job they got, they will take it. Uh, they are not looking for coming to Grameen Bank as something that they feel that this is important. Uh, because so they are so desperate to get a job because there are so many unemployed young people. It needs four or five, six people. So they uh, hear from each other, friends bring friends, and try it out. Probably that's much easier here. Yeah, more informal rather than formal. Yeah. Uh, my name is Laura Dominguez. I work for the Academy for International, uh, excuse me, Academy for Educational Development. My question is, um, could you describe um, how unequal gender roles have affected the work, considering that majority of clients are women? Uh, gender role for? In that um, a lot of times women are not encouraged to work outside the home. They're not encouraged to be the holders of money, to be, you know, the man's usually in charge. Yeah. Uh, we, first of all, this is the first time that they, they have done that. So it, uh, it needed courage for them to do. And it was easy f by coming bank, not requiring them to come to our office. Uh, the entire Grameen Bank system, wherever it goes, whether in Bangladesh or in New York City, is the same. The basic principle is people should not go to the bank. Bank should go to the people. So we go to them. That makes it very convenient. Even at that convenience level, 
it was extremely difficult for them to do the job because there was opposition within the family. Husband was opposed to it. Uh, men in general were opposed to women getting the money and getting involved with business. Uh, there are religious opposition. Some people made it a uh, opposition from the re religious ground. So there are lots of opposition. Some, in some cases, women are thrown out of the village because she wanted to join Grameen Bank. Uh, and she went to another village and joined Grameen Bank there. She didn't give up because she needed the money. She wants to work. Uh, but she had to be thrown out. Uh, she couldn't be accepted by the villagers. But soon, more women wanted it. Gradually, that uh, opposition to Grameen Bank disappeared from the same village, which originally thrown out the uh, woman who wanted to join Grameen Bank. So there were tensions within the family, within the society. They had to overcome, and we helped them uh, go through it uh, so that in a way uh, it is, uh, they can take it and continue with that process. So it was not easy, but uh, now uh, almost the whole bank is women, <laughs> and uh, they are the one who are the owners of the bank. So it took a long time to do that. Hi, my name is Jeff Klein. Um, my question is around how you manage to, to keep the default rates so low, assuming that the borrowers are setting up new businesses and you know, new businesses always face challenges and, and the health of the people can fail and other things can happen in, in their lives. What does the bank do to, to keep the default rates so low? We tried right from the beginning to design a system which doesn't rely on punishment. So we try to avoid punishment of all kinds. So the people feel friendly that uh, I'm not punished for anything. Uh, a failure in a Grameen Bank uh, borrower's business is not something that we will be shocked. How did you fail? You're not supposed to fail. Our business in business, you fail. That's uh, nothing new. For poor people, it's more usual than others to fail because you have so many hurdles in your life. It's very usual to fail. But one failure doesn't bring end to everything. So try again. Our system is such we allow that. We don't forgive the loan. We don't waive the, waive the loan. Loan remains. But she gets a second, second chance to start again. So we'll be with her. We say we are not with the money. We are not for the money. We are for you. So we will t help you as long as it takes. So that way we reschedule the loan. Rescheduling the loan is very easy for us. It's not something that we have to kind of wreck our brain how to reschedule because it's so often we have to do that. For example, Bangladesh is a disaster prone country. Floods, cyclones are very frequent. And we, when a flood happens, it's the poorest people who gets washed off. So if you insist that give me my money back, the bank will disappear. It makes no sense. And instead, we said, OK, we are with you. Let's start all over again. So we start all over again. The loans remain in the book. It's a long-term loan. The current one becomes the immediate loan and so on. So we need our rules in such a way it fits your uh, way of living and way of uh, uh, how you experience your life. So it's, but no money is uh, forgiven or forgotten. It's every, it's a means, but timing gets different. Hello. Uh, my name is Sabina Rogers. I work for the SEEP Network. Um, Thank you very much for coming, Professor Yunus. It's Thank a you. wonderful thing to meet you. And I'd like to say if you're looking to participate in other conferences, my organization has an annual conference in November. <laughs> <laughs> um, the SEEP Annual Conference. We are an association of organizations who do microfinance or microenterprise. Great. Congratulations. Um, so Grameen Foundation USA is a member, actually. But I have a specific question. You talked about Grameen Health and the insurance, the health insurance. That I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about that. Specifically, um, will the cell phone women be the ones that are like the the conduit for the system? Um, how will people be paying for that? 
Um, when will you, well, most specifically, when do you expect to be rolling this out, and will it only be in Bangladesh, or are you planning to do that in some of the other countries as well? Any of those questions, if you want to address those, that would be great. Okay. 